Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Alan McGinley, and I'm the director of TNEC Public Library. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, for another program in our series of Black History Month events. Uh, this program is made possible through a partnership between the Enslaved African Memorial Committee and the TNEC Public Library. Um, <clears throat> as you know, uh, TNEC Library is working with the Enslaved African Memorial Committee and the Holocaust Committee to build a, a garden to nurture human understanding um, here in TNEC on the municipal lawn. And this uh, project would consist of two memorials uh, dedicated to um, enslaved Africans and also to the Holocaust. I've seen some of what the panelists are gonna share with you today and I'm very happy that we're able to, to share this panel with the TNET community. I think we're very fortunate. Before we get started though, I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Jack Chen who will introduce today's panelists. Dr. Jack Chen is the Clement A. Price Mellon, Professor of Public History and Humanities at Rutgers University in Newark, as well as the director of the Clement Price Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience. Dr. Chen founded the Asian Pacific American Program and Institute at NYU and is co-founder of the Museum of Chinese in America. Recently, he founded the New York Newark Public History Project funded by the Ford Foundation, which will reframe the history of the estuarial region, starting with the twined foundational histories of dispossession and enslavement. Uh, work emerging from serving as a commissioner on the NYC Mayor's Commission on Monuments. So I'll turn things over to uh, Dr. Jack Chen. Uh, thank you, Al. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, the Tina Public Library, which does great work. I also wanted to just say thank you to Patricia King Butler and Natasha Robert, uh, Robert as well. Uh, Patricia is the uh, director of the Enslaved African Memorial Committee. And uh, congratulations goes to the committee because they just, uh, they just received the Giles Wright award from the New Jersey Historical Commission, which is a, pres a prestigious kind of acknowledgement of the important work that is being done. Uh, so thank you, Patricia, for all that great work and thank you for organizing this session. Um, in fact, that award will be presented at the Marian Thompson Wright uh, Lecture Series, which is next uh, Saturday, uh, the 20th, and I'll, I'll send a poster to everybody. That's the uh, Price Institute that I, I, I run. So I hope you can all join us for that. Uh, I also want to just say a quick uh, acknowledgement that we're on Muncie Lunape lands, uh, who had tended these lands of Northern New Jersey, going into New York, New York uh, uh, Connecticut, also uh, Eastern Pennsylvania for thousands of years. And it was, they had really developed massive trail systems. They cultivated trees um, throughout the region. Uh, Three Sisters Gardens, Medicinals, and they built uh, these fantastic rock structures that were both um, practical, uh, such as stone weirs catching fish in the Pacific River and other rivers, but also cosmological and sacred. Uh, we have kind of not kept track of those stories that have been so critical, uh, which is really also a failing, quite frankly, of uh, college and the educational systems. I have a PhD in history, and it's not something that I learned uh, at NYU. Uh, so that's something that I think we're all trying to change now. Uh, part of the recognition and acknowledgement of the experience of uh, the region of enslaved peoples and of indentured peoples is part of that kind of omission and erasure that we are trying to change and the work of the, uh, of the enslaved um, African Memorial Committee is trying to change. Uh, but also it's the work that still has to be done by teachers uh, to really acknowledge the fact that uh, Muncie Lenape people are still alive and here in the region, and they have a history that we really need to acknowledge and reckon with. Uh, so it's my honor and pleasure to be moderating this session today with three extremely accomplished um, uh, individuals uh, who I'll just mention a tiny bit in terms of their extensive kind of work, but I'll just give you a little bit of hint of it. Otherwise, we um, won't even be able to have their presentations and a discussion. Uh, first, I'm delighted to introduce Peggy King-Jord, 
who is an architecturally trained cultural projects consultant and the former project director of memorialization uh, for the New York African Burial Ground National Monument and Interpretive Center. Uh, it's really one of the foremost uh, monuments and interpretive centers in the world. Uh, and she is a native of Albany, Georgia and the daughter of renowned civil rights attorney C.B. King. Uh, Professor Lorenzo Pace is an artist, uh, curator, uh, author, master storyteller, performance artist, and lecturer. Uh, his soaring 300-foot granite sculpture, Triumph of the Human Spirit, is at Foley Square in the Civic Center of uh, Municipal Buildings in downtown Manhattan, just adjacent to Chinatown, so it's a place that I passed all the time. Uh, his studio is in Brooklyn, and I'm hoping to visit that studio someday when uh, we can all uh, get together in person again. Um, and Rodney Leon is the founder and principal architect of Rodney Leon Architects. Uh, Mr. Leon is perhaps best known for designing the African Burial Ground Memorial uh, that resulted in Peggy's uh, fantastic work. And it's just above uh, Professor Pace's sculpture. Uh, I also have to mention that Mr. Leon's The Ark of Return, uh, created on the UN Plaza in 2015, was a UNESCO memorial to the victims of international enslavement. And it's on permanent view in that plaza. And he's also formulated the concept of culturally contextual contemporary design in terms of uh, architecture and design principles. Uh, so um, without any further uh, delay, I wanted to just mention that the format for this is that each person will be presenting their work uh, and showing some images of their work. Uh, and it'll be each about 20 minutes. And then, then at the end of those 20 minute presentations, we're gonna be having a discussion and there's a chance for you all to ask questions uh, on the Q&A line of the uh, Zoom. So uh, we are gonna go in the order that I introduced them. So Peggy, please, if you could uh, join us and welcome, it's great to see you. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank the Enslaved African Memorial Committee, um, Patricia Butler King or King Butler. Uh, you know, she's really kind of a relative. I'm a Peggy King, so I'm, I'm convinced we'll, we'll find a connection. Um, and it's also a pleasure to uh, share um, um, in this virtual panel with uh, Rodney Leon and Dr. Lorenzo Pace. All right, I'm gonna share a, a, um, a PowerPoint and followed by uh, a film trailer um, tied to a project that I'm cur currently working with. So if you would, please pull up the first slide. 30 years ago, while working for New York's first African-American mayor, I never imagined my career would take me on a journey helping to lead the fight to protect a burial ground for free and enslaved African people. The site would ultimately gain significant international attention, and I would serve at the helm to implement plans for honoring the memory of more than 20,000 individuals enslaved and free. Next slide. I also never imagined a move from my native South Georgia to New York City to pursue a career in architecture would result in me challenging government authorities who would spark outrage when they issued a gag order intended to render invisible the human remains and indeed the lives of an African people who had remarkably survived the Middle Passage. You see, I'm a descendant of enslaved people born under an American apartheid delivered in the basement of a segregated hospital in Albany, Georgia. I'm the daughter of a civil rights attorney who defended Martin Luther King and a courageous mother and educator who raised five independent developing minds and in her own right was a community activist. I was the first black child to desegregate my first grade class at an all white public school. And while I remember being called by many names, I was rarely called 
by my birth name. And two years before I entered that school, my father was beaten by a sheriff named Cull Campbell, a Georgia cracker and an officer of the law. While I was too young to remember this photo of my father, bloodied, the image was legendary and appeared in the New York Times. In the lower left photo, you'll find the sheriff pictured arrogantly showing off his collection of walking canes, one of which he used to beat my father for trying to visit his client, a white civil rights protester who had been arrested, jailed, and had his jaw broken by other white inmates. And upon my father's passing, one of my four brothers and I designed and handcrafted our father's coffin, upper right picture, to lay him to rest with dignity and respect. Next slide. So it's no wonder why I experienced a profound personal outrage when I learned that the US government authorities issued a gag order where in my view, attempting to erase the memory, lives and history unfolding at the New York African burial ground. This was a story about my community, my history and it mattered who would tell their story. Mounting a preservation campaign that threatens to go against the grain of government authorities and their agenda can reap consequences. And for a campaign to thrive, a groundswell of support would be needed from community of stakeholders who understood the meaning of what we were trying to achieve and what the national consciousness stood to gain. So I worked with others to galvanize preservation and community adv advocates, and we solicited support of government authorities, political leaders, and influencers to help dismantle the cultural indifference that plagued the site from the start. Next slide. Eventually, it took an act of Congress to halt construction, call for a public hearing, which later resulted in scrapping of a portion of the original building design. Construction funding was reappropriated to develop a comprehensive plan for honoring the thousands buried throughout the historic district. As executive director, I curated the design competition and advanced the Federal Steering Committee's plan for a memorial design, an interpretive center, the reburial, and the related ceremony for over 400 human remains, including installing several public art commissions designed to ensure the lives, deaths, and history, um, to ensure that they were kept safe and remembered. Next slide. Owing to the overwhelming public support and political will, the Landmarks and Preservation Commission designated the original boundaries of the burial ground, a historically protected district as a way of guarding against the adverse impacts of any future development. Artists were commissioned to create works throughout the historic district, including, including bronze sidewalk medallions shown upper right, uh, sharing the site's history, and the iconic sculpture by Lorenzo Pace, Triumph of the Human Spirit, which soars in Foley Square Park, honoring more than 20,000 ancestors buried in the district. Since its installation, scores of New Yorkers have gathered around its base to speak up or speak out to affect social change. It is a testament to the fact that physical reminders are what we use to keep ourselves close to important places, people, and events. Next slide. Inside the federal building, renowned artists were commissioned by an art panel to design works that were intended to make visible a history and truth that had been for hundreds of years rendered invisible. Artists created works that would have permanence being integrated into building floors, walls, and the facade. Here in the central rotunda of the building is the floor design called Ring Shout by the design team Conwell Pace and Majoso. We were intentional about identifying locations for art where they would have prominence in the building. We were intent about upon helping to transform cultural, the cultural landscape of the building by reminding visitors and employees every day that they were walking on sacred ground and that these were lives never to be forgotten. We envisioned this public space for community engagement, reflection, and work as a way of sustaining the power of this place. Next slide. 
The success of the New York African Burial Ground ignited a movement towards preservation equity and awareness, the development of new academic curriculums with the promise of truth telling. Conversations surrounding reparations, cultural heritage, and importance, the importance of controlling the narrative when interpreting our history and more. The New York Afri African Burial Ground has become the touchstone for similar sites at home and abroad, and it inspires, informs stakeholders where it concerns reclaiming spaces, spaces of identity and sites of conscience, such as the case with the liberated African depot on the island of St. Helena, a British territory in the South Atlantic, about six days off of the coast of Cape Town, South Africa, rec recognized uh, six days by boat, um, recognized as one of the most significant traces of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, it is a middle passage site. The site is most known for uh, having served as host to Napoleon when he was uh, exiled on the island. I have now stretched my sights beyond the shores of the US and am focusing on the larger journey <clears throat> into slavery, its beginnings and all of the spaces and places in between. Because understanding that slavery is not regional but part of a massive whole, not bound by state lines or watery shores, but by the dis-ease of financial gain and the grotesque disenfranchisement of African people. Our story is still at risk here and abroad, doing the groundwork to protect sites that promise to help tell a more complete story, a more global story, uh, and to bring integrity and meaning to our collective history is job number one for me. Next slide. I was invited to work with two young British filmmakers, Joe Curran and Dominic Devere and Anina Van Neel, who is from Namibia, who I consider my sister in the struggle on the ground. Pictured to my right, uh, Anina's picture to my right in the group shot, and in the photo with me in a Georgia cotton field. Over the past three plus years, I've been helping to meet the challenges similar to those I confronted 30 years prior to save a sacred site threatened by development. As a cultural projects consultant and preservation activist, I, activate, I, mean, I advocate to protect disenfranchised histories and the sites of conscience in the US and abroad. As a film participant in this British-based documentary, I help awareness, I help build awareness and share my insights on meeting the challenges to preserve this unique Middle Passage site. And as an impact producer, I help transition awareness into action. In 2018, I was on the ground in St. Helena working with St. stakeholders, the community, and several months later hosted our film team during a trip to New York City for a visit to the African burial ground, followed by a week long trip through my native South to the lynching memorial Montgomery, to Savannah, Georgia, Charleston, South Carolina, and St. Helena, South Carolina, contemplating the vestiges of slavery that defined the lives of black people here and abroad. Next slide. Since last year, I have worked lobbying for support from British and American political leaders, influencers, international organizations, and more to help build a groundswell of interest and support to save this site and mark its significance. Next slide. The saints, as they are affectionately known, the people who live on the island of St. Helena, the saint de descendants and our global community of descendants must use this opportunity to demand the dignity and respect deserved by all slave trade victims. The map that you see at the top is actually a map of the valley, which is called Rupert's Valley. And to the far left of that map is actually the Atlantic Ocean, the edge. And it is now being developed as a port container storage site. 
um, you would typically, the road that runs down the center would lead you to the African burial ground. There is, there are actually three areas or two areas of the burial ground. One that kind of looks like a little knee um, in the middle of that map uh, is that's an upper burial ground and then one further down. Uh, there are also structures that are still in place that were there during the time that this was the Liberated African Depot. The building on the lower left was used as uh, an infirmary uh, for the basically that whole valley, which was um, uh, a, a camp for enslaved Africans who were taken off of ships, hulls of ships that were en route to the Americas. They were enslaved and these were ships that, it, that the British naval officers had arrested um, folks who were dealing in illegal, the illegal slave trade. Uh, and the people who, the enslaved Africans who were on those ships would then be uh, offloaded into this valley and kept uh, basically in, in an internment camp uh, until they went on to either Jamaica or other British colony uh, areas. And so to call it a liberated African depot, is, 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 there's, there's really no truth to that because none of the Africans who ended up there uh, were ever returned to uh, any part of Africa and they all went on to uh, other British territories. Uh, the lower right picture is in fact um, the storage of the, it is a storage site of 325 remains that have been stored there for over 10 years um, that were retrieved from the valley when an airport road, access road was installed. And the upper right photograph is actually a stone wall which was built that encircled a garden which was built by these enslaved Africans during their time there. The port development now threatens to store, if you know anything about Elizabeth, New Jersey, um, and those containers that you see stacked high, that's what will happen just adjacent to that stone wall. Next slide, please. Mm. And so we're fighting and this is, this is you know, the idea of uh, the weaponization of development and how it will, the plans in the upper left for development, for the port development and imagining these port, um, these metal containers stacked next to this wall that we'd like to save uh, and keep uh, and, and treat with respect and somehow incorporate in a larger cultural heritage district. But the threat is real and it is moving forward. Next slide. So we must accept nothing less uh, and envision something greater than ourselves. Let's do this work. Generations of descendants of slaves require us to make this right. And so I'd like to cue the film that gives you a better idea of the project that we're working on in St. Helena. We're gonna move on now to uh, Professor uh, Lorenzo Pace, uh, who's going to be talking about his work, and then uh, both Peggy and Lorenzo will be joining us after uh, the final presentation by Rodney Leon. Professor uh, Pace, please. Mm -hmm. Oh, 
Before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free and be free and go home to my Lord and be free and be free. Hi, everybody. I like to give homage to my ancestors. Before I open my mouth, I like to acknowledge my ancestors. My ancestors from where I've come and my ancestors from, the, from, from where the world have come. Because the world starts in my ancestors and from my ancestors, the whole world, red, brown, yellow, black, white, all come from my ancestors, Africa, Africa, Africa. So my topic is triumph of the human spirit. When I say triumph of the human spirit, I'm talking about our triumph here in this country. I'm talking about American history. I'm talking about the African American really challenging history in this country. And it starts with slavery. And that's one of the most challenging topics that we have still have us still grapple with how do you tell our story and how do you begin to tell our story our story is a very challenging story but we have to talk about it it's like a a a, a recurring sore on your hand or your back or somewhere and you touch the topic of racism and it bleeds all over again, but that's, we have to heal from that. And what's so beautiful about our history is that we have thrived against the odds. And to my left, you see my father and you see my uncle, where I started my story with the lock that was passed down by his father to me. And to my right, you see the picture of the lock and you see my first bronze sculpture that relates to the African bearer coming to this country. And to the top, you see a painting, Jelani and the homeboys going to the African American Museum to take the lock and the lock is the start of my story because that's where my history starts in Tuskegee, Alabama. And I want to first start talking about my book, Jelani and the Lock. Jelani and the Lock is a little boy taken from Africa, brought to the Americas, put in locks and chain, and of course, Abraham Lincoln feeding the slaves. So, now we can begin to show some of the imagery of my four children's books. The first book, Jelani and the Lock, and that's where our American history starts. That's where the American history starts from this little book. And that book has been translated into three different languages, French, Dutch, and Spanish. All were major colonizers in my history that relates to slavery. And so now we'll look at Jelani and the Lock, the book itself. And then we'll go to 
uh, my other book. In Sankofa, you have to connect for your past in order to know where you're going for the future. And I think it's important that we not only know for ourselves, but to teach our children about our past. Our past is painful, yes. And that's one of the things that inspired me to write my book, because my daughter, who's now 16, when she was eight years old, asked me, Daddy, are we from slaves? That was a pr provocative question for me, an eight-year-old, to, to drop on me. And how do you explain that to a, a kid without feeling shame? I'm gonna not read the book, I'm gonna perform the book for you. And I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna perform it in a way that touches on my beginning here in this country. My little book, Jelani. In In my other books, you will see Harry Tutman, Harry Tutman, and of course, she's going to be on the $20 bill coming up, hopefully this year, which is a real, real American hero, she role, anyway role you want to call her. She was an enormous, enormous help into freeing so many different of our ancestors as slaveries. And, and completely leaving the, the bondage of slavery herself to go back and to extract from the South, which I'm from, Alabama, and bring the elements to the North, part of the abolition movement. And then I go over to my brother, Frederick Douglass, who was a, a great orator, was a slave himself, also a real, real fighting for freedom and everything that you can think of. Frederick Douglass and the North Star. Wrote many books, the, the, developed so many different papers. Also a great, great orator for Martin, uh, Abraham Lincoln in terms of helping free the slaves. Then I go on over to my contemporary, Martin Luther King. In 1966, King came to Chicago, where I was a kid, where I was raised in Chicago. King came in and had a major march in Marquette Park, where he was stoned. I was also part of the march. Then he went on to Soldier's Field and gave a great, great speech in 1968, 1967, in, uh, in Chicago Soldier's Field. So my books deals with the abolitionist movement, bringing it up all the way up to contemporary time of Martin Luther King, which deals with our struggle here in this country starting at the very beginning of Jelani, a little boy taken from Africa, brought to the Americas. So our struggle and our continuous fight them for equality, our fight them for continuously being respected as human beings, and never forget we were considered three-fourths of a human being. We were not considered human beings. So we have come a long way. And we still have such a long way to go. But it's all, all of us to be a part of that. And it's not just on my story, just on my uh, telling the story about our history. It's all of our story. It's the basic foundations of American story. And then you see in 
our American story, it's a very challenging for all of us. But it's a beautiful challenge. Because if you look at what will come before us, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, and Martin Luther King, you'll let you know that we are really on the right track. And that's where I want to start with talking about the, the, uh, the, the, the burial ground in lower Manhattan. And when my father passed away in 1991, I go back to the South to bury him. When I come back, they discover the African burial ground. So now we can see some of that part of that old process of the history. And so I come back to New York and they discovered the African burial ground in lower Manhattan. And I was just shocked, you know, because first of all, I had a lock in my possession that the, the link, that, that linked me directly to the enslaved population here in New York. So I go down, jumped over the fence, and began to photograph the site. That was me connecting myself with our past. It was my privilege to be mayor d during the time that uh, it was discovered that blacks, uh, slaves, and uh, were buried in, in that area because they, were, they would not permit black folks to be buried within the city. This area was beyond the city boundaries. We don't think often about New York and slavery. We think of the South, but it was going on here as well. When they had a call off for an artist to, to build this monument, I said, well, hey, you know, I might as well throw my hat in the ring, too, <laughs> since I had this lock. <laughs> and I threw my hat in the ring, you know, and I was very fortunate enough to, I think the ancestors was the one that really said, hey, okay, now let me show you that you got the link to the lock and the key, so, hey, it's, I'm going to give it to you to be, I have nothing to do with it. You know, I was just a pawn in the process of being uh, uh, awarded. At the bottom there, you see the boat. The boat represents the very early Native American that used to boat in this area. This area was fishing and wild game. The boat also represents the middle passage for African and African Americans. Also, the boat represents the immigrants, the immigrants that came here mostly by boat. And and water. On top of the boat, you see the chihuahua. The chihuahua is an antelope, and you see the antelope with the two horns. There's a male and, and female version of the antelope. And my inspiration to build this monument comes from the female antelope because she carries the baby. You see the, the, the two horns, the very hot, the big horns. Then you see the little t small two horns in the back. That's the baby, and the baby represents the next generation. And you see the beak, the beak of the antelope points towards directly to the African burial ground and points to the ground where the African were uh, discovered. So the monument, monument has been there for 20 years, and we uh, had our big celebration. Uh, last year october 24 and in that on that day we had to do our mass and social distancing because covid was still a major aspect of the but we had to do something to celebrate the 20th year and that's what you're going to see going forward the uh, photographs and we call it Human Spirit Day. Human Spirit Day, why? Because universal aspect of our human, com com uh, our human connectionness. And we had drummers, and you see uh, aspects of singers playing in front of the monument and had a beautiful day that day.
a really celebratory event for all of us to share the 20th year here in New York City on that day. And that's me, you know, uh, celebrating the event. And on that day also, the, the, the borough president came and gave a, a speech as well as a proclamation for Human Spirit Day, Appreciation Day. And we all really, really, really appreciate it. And then you see the proclamation from the borough president of New York City. And on that day, the borough president got together with about 15 different artists called TACA, ORC, and they, and she renamed the, the boulevard around the monument, Black Lives Matter Boulevard. And so that's what we're dealing with right here now because we're dealing with the systemic racism here in this country that has to be dealt with. And I call it the great reckoning at this moment in time, because that's one of the sore points that we have have to deal with here in this country, because in terms of dealing with our systemic racism, we have to understand that it's been here for a while and we have to eradicate it. So, and you see the, the center of the monument and it's like a starburst, sunburst, and that was a part of the design. And you see the Black Lives Matter uh, and all the artists select a, a letter and they all designed the letter the way they felt was good for them. And you see the first letter B is from an artist from Ghana, West Africa. And all the artists selected what they wanted to put in those lettering. So now you'll see the video. And so in that presentation, you get a snippet of uh, our history, a little bit, and I think we have so much to, to learn. We have so much to share and so much to do. But it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful process because we're rewriting the history of America. And, and rewriting the history we're all a part of, everybody's a part of. And when we saw the, the many, many people protesting Black Lives Matter this summer, and I participated in so many ones, myself here in Brooklyn, as well as Manhattan, because when I saw all these young kids out there of all ethnic groups, Mexican, whites, Polish, Jewish, all kinds of people protesting what we have gone through in this country. And it's a very, very beautiful thing to see me protesting when King came to Chicago and see these, me here in Brooklyn, partic participating in a much multicultural aspect of protesting of racism. Very, very challenging. Very, very beautiful thing to see and to be a part of and to be alive at this specific time in time, especially for the young kids to be participating in this. Because just remember, King was only 26 when he started. 
I remember John Lewis was, what, 18, 19 when he started. So we have a lot of work to do, but it's beautiful though. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed to seeing what's going on this summer. This summer I was a part of it, to be a part of it. And to share that moment in time, that means that, hey, that's progress. That's progress. That's progress. That's progress. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pace. A fantastic uh, full presentation. Um, and we look forward to diving deeper into your vision of the past, but especially of the future. Thank you so much. Um, next, and not at all least, is we have uh, Rodney Leon who is the person who actually designed the African Memorial uh, sculpture at the African burial ground. Um, Mr. Leon, we're really happy that uh, you can join us. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chen. Uh, thank you, uh, Peggy and Lorenzo and Pat King for pulling this event together. Uh, both Lorenzo and Peggy are really instrumental in terms of uh, my experience being able to have an opportunity to work on the design of the African Program Memorial. Uh, Peggy and the, the activism and historic work that she did in Lorenzo, building the first major monument to our ancestors in the African burial ground and serving as a mentor to me for so many years. Thank you both. Um, I, I've had an opportunity not only to, to design and work on memorial projects uh, for our ancestors, like the African burial ground, but I've also explored and, and really been thinking about more recently the reawakening that is happening uh, around our cities and around our country and around the world to take the energy that is out there and to begin to understand how we can begin to reevaluate, redefine and create places and spaces that acknowledge the contributions of communities that have been for so long uh, forsaken and ignored. And I've been you know, thinking recently very much about how to start to reveal these kind of concealed histories through the implementation of uh, monuments and memorials uh, and cultural activities, and I decided that you know I was going to do a have a course, and I'd like to share a presentation uh, that's grounded on the questions around a course that I'll be teaching at NYU on redefining public space and the transforming role that memorials and public art can can play in in this moment that we're experiencing right now. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, <clears throat> How many of us have taken the time to stop and to look at statues? monuments, plaques, and plazas that are integrated into our urban fabric. Just in New York City alone, we have at least 10 national monuments and nationally recognized historic sites. These historic objects and spaces all too often blend into our surrounding city as a backdrop and are rarely engaged with or considered in any significant way. For many reasons, either conscious or subconscious, their presence reinforces narratives that are part 
of our collective identity as citizens. Every once in a while, we are reminded of the existence of these objects and spaces and of their importance. These places communicate to people visiting our city from around the world and to each other, ideas about who we are, what we value, and who we aspire to be. Recent events regarding the significance of these symbols, the roles they play in constructing our identities, and the controversies surrounding them <clears throat> that, we have, that have erupted around the country have shown that they represent something more important than many of us have thought previously. The push and pull between the past, the present, and future visions of our society has been featured prominently recently in the media. In the last few years, we've seen demands and historic changes taking place for gender equality around the Me Too movement and the removal of statues and flags symbolizing the Confederacy throughout the South and in the rise of a massive global Black Lives Matter protest movement mobilized against institutionalized racism. People have shown through protests and action the desire for both the structures and the symbols of oppression to be dismantled and more equitable and inclusive narratives to be told. Challenging the significance and relevance of public monuments is one part of this larger reawakening and struggle for justice and equality. In the midst of this reawakening, those of us tasked with reimagining the struggle for justice and equality and establishing policies and mechanisms for managing its implementation are really inspired by the actions of the people that you see here in these images. In 2017, as a response to public outcry regarding the appropriateness of statues honoring figures with controversial histories, New York City Mayoral Advisory Commission was established. Dr. Chen is on that commission. The commission's role was to to advise and make recommendations on the creation and removal of public art monuments and markers on city owned property. A report was issued in 2018. And in that report, the commission's recommendations emphasized public dialogue and additive measures to ensure monuments and markers on city property were given accurate and inclusive historical context. Most of the monuments that we are usually aware of are primarily classical figures and sculptures. A recent transformative example is the monument sculpted by artist Kahinde Wiley. This monument entitled, and I'm gonna go back, for those of you not familiar, this is the monument from Kahinde Wiley. That monument <clears throat> entitled <clears throat> from Kahinde Wiley, Rumors of War, was, was briefly exhibited in New York City's Times Square before being sent to its permanent home in Richmond, Virginia. This piece featured the proud figure of a young African-American male equestrian with braided hair as a defiant gesture and comment on Confederate military statues many of us are familiar with. We're at a point in time where the public must demand that artists and designers go even further in exercising their creativity and freedom to explore and establish alternative contemporary expanded definitions of what a monument or memorial can be. I've been able to develop specific approaches to the design of contemporary memorials with an emphasis on cultural contexts along with history as precedents in the process of making public space. It is this philosophy and process that provides inspiration for two public memorials honoring the memory of people of African descent in New York City. The African Burial Ground National Monument and the Ark of Return, the permanent memorial to honor the victims of slavery and the transatlantic slave trade in the United States. Perhaps in this time of public discourse, reflection and transformation, these two contemporary examples of architectural precedents may provide cultural, historic and political lessons that can be applied to the design and transformation of contemporary memorials. At the time of this writing, the African Burial Ground National Monument was still the only national monument to slavery in the United States. His presence locates the absence and is indicative of the erasures of African-American histo history in public space. 
Reflecting on the erasure of the original burial ground, which is largely forgotten for over a century, we are reminded that this part of our history is often deconstructed, de-emphasized, and dematerialized. It must, in my mind, be re-emphasized, reconstructed, and rematerialized. African-American space, like African-American history, must not be seen as being separate and apart from a larger American historical or architectural context. We should strive to make the intangible more tangible through a process of rematerialization, revealing and unveiling. Architecture like history is a tool that can be used to conceal as well as to reveal. Architecture like history can also be used to tell our stories. What are the processes that we can use to create these public spaces? Well, fundamentally to this process, we need to add an understanding of context. Though I don't mean by context what we typically mean by that. I don't mean by physical form or physical space nor physical environments. What I mean is more specifically a sense of the intangible, history, culture, society, the arts. These are intangible aspects which when used effectively are powerful tools in establishing a framework and narrative for public art in general and memorials more specifically. The histories I refer to are the ones that have been underemphasized, ignored, and suppressed. The reasons for this suppression may vary, but some histories have also been sidelined and maligned by those wishing to maintain and reinforce prevailing narratives through which institutions maintain their power. As students, artists, policy educators, planners, architects, and as citizens, if we are to be ignorant of these facts of our history, we risk obscuring and clouding and denying the potential to address or resolve current and future conflicts around the issue of representation in public art. Memorials in urban spaces are an ideal typology through which to explore these kinds of ideas and contexts. Memorials engage the public at the intersection of culture and history. This intersection is a powerful catalyst in the evolution of our collective identity and memory. To engage the intersection of culture and history in the design process is to engage complex social and political challenges. The result of such engagement is a physical manifestation of our collective experiences, our memories, our histories, our contexts. Context requires that complex and contradictory needs exist simultaneously. Public memorialization provides individual space for reflection and contemplation, but at the same time provides space for public gathering and celebration. These sacred spaces of solace within the secular and commercialized cities are places where we can simultaneously reach back to our past and project ourselves into the future. The design and creation of a more and memorialization is being constituted by more than just simple physical form. Rather, public memorial is a place of ideas occupying the space between design, architecture, art, and culture. Some specific context areas that are significantly important include education, urban presence, culture, symbolism, spirituality, universality, and interactivity. These are seven guidelines that we use in order for us to describe and goals that we have for all of our memorial designs. We want them to be educational so that children and people can see them as an opportunity for which to communicate our histories of the past for us to move forward into the future in the spirit of Sankofa. I'd like to share with you all also a video that we're working on uh, a project with the Enslaved African Memorial Committee. Uh, for a project which is part of a, a larger memorial design garden in Teaneck. Uh, we're working on that project along with a couple of others. And this particular project uh, has a, a six minute video and I'd like to see if we can cue that up right now. I'll stop sharing my screen.
fall down. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Thank you so much, uh, Rodney Leon. That was um, deeply moving, and it's very exciting to see what's going to happen in Teaneck uh, with the support of so many people, uh, hopefully very soon. Um, we have um, a little bit of time now, but I thought um, what I would do is maybe kind of comment on the three presentations that we've had as a way of kind of pulling together some thoughts. Uh, because we don't have too much time. And, and in fact, um, uh, Al, you know, if you could just let me know um, how much time we really have. Um, but um, let me just say that uh, these three presentations are kind of like a master class in terms of not just how to do something, but to bring together this historical legacy that has not been acknowledged in a place like New York City, in a place like the metropolitan region, this history has not been told. And we tend to think somehow that the bad experience of enslaved peoples was in the South. And if we could just get the South to kind of, uh, to, to come along, then we'll be okay. Or that it's simply uh, the bad president, whether it be the recent one we just had or Andrew Jackson, right? But in fact, if we look at the systemic history that's embedded in our past, we just see so many elements that are intransigent and that are part of the kind of uh, amnesia uh, that we have as a society and the inability of our culture, our political culture to actually grapple with very difficult questions. So I really appreciate th the three presentations because they are a beautiful example of how we can surface, surface what has been buried, repressed, erased uh, in a way that can get us to deal with not so much the past, but really deal with the present and have a vision for the future that is not simply about somehow make America great ag again when it was a white supremacist society and culture when people were put into their places because of segregation, Jim Crow, but also Chinese were excluded. Um, the, the Mexican peoples whose land the United States actually occupied were put onto the other side of the border or corralled into uh, communities that would not really recognize um, their deep history in the American, the US Southwest. So, uh, so Peggy's questions really embody in, in so many ways the power of places and the power of not simply a national place or a, a New York City place, but the ways in which our places are deeply intertwined because of global forces, global, the global forces of enslavement, the global forces of an economy in the Atlantic world that linked these different places together in a way of exploiting, of course, goods that were trade, traded, um, the, the, the sugar cane that was created, that created rum, um, the cotton industry that was created that linked the plantation south to the cotton mills of, of England, um, all these deep intertwined connections of ways of extracting as much as possible from the land of the new world the dispossession of the indigenous people from that world, the creation of plantations on that very land itself in which enslaved African peoples then will work that land, will provide the, the, the exploited labor to create value so that the profit making could happen. So that system is one that has not simply uh, been forgotten and is not simply of the past, but it's something that continues to this day. And that's why these memorials, even if we don't have them uh, in every single place they have to be, these historical memorials and the reconstruction of that history and the telling of those stories are so incredibly important. And to tell it in a place like the New York City region 
is even more important in some ways because this is where people imagine the best of American culture to be. And they imagine this is such a accepting pluralistic place. It's something we strive for, but we have not reckoned with that past and we have not grappled with that present. And of course we see during this moment of, of pandemic how these issues get played out once again, even in the distribution of vaccinations. So when, um, when Dr. Pace talks about uh, the, the interrelationship and intertwining of the people of New York City and the people of this nation in the port of New York City and how those histories are so intertwined, it, I really appreciate that because of course, uh, the fully square sculpture, which is so beautiful, is something I've passed all the time. And so is the African burial ground monument that, um, that Rodney Leon designed, I pass all the time because right adjacent to what had been the historic black community, the original black community of New York City, the, the site in which the auction block at the Eastern side of Wall Street had been built. We have this map of how the very beginnings of New York City as the Dutch colony of New Netherlands was already spatialized by race. And the boweries that African Americans were settled on, the freed African Americans were settled on, was outside of that wall, in part because of the massacres that the Dutch had waged against the native peoples. And they ended up kind of serving as a bit of a buffer zone between the Dutch colonists who had, who had created that massacre and the, and the Lenape peoples who were, of course, uh, deeply wounded and pushed out of the region. So when, when Professor Pace talks about the opening of that monument, that beautiful soaring 300 foot granite monument, and he, he hasn't shared the fact that on opening day, he refused to attend because it was on Columbus day. So that ability to see the larger picture and the ability to understand that native peoples do not acknowledge Columbus Day because that was really the beginning of their extermination, the extermination campaigns that were waged upon them by the colonists. Then that shows an amazing solidarity and understanding of what the larger American project that has never quite been fulfilled really is. And when Rodney Leon talks about how the places of solace to consider the legacies of this past can be places in which a future can be birthed with a beautiful, uh, beautiful African man who's, who's laid out in that, uh, in that sculpture at the United Nations Plaza. We have the evocation of in some ways the spirits of all these past uh, folks who have been uh, unjustly uh, pushed away and out and ignored and forgotten. And we have the possibility of a future being birthed only by the acknowledgement and by the recognition and by the unerasure and by the surfacing of those spirits who have been buried uh, and have been forgotten. So um, uh, if we have a little bit of time, um, I'm hoping maybe we could have um, uh, Peggy, if you don't mind, uh, maybe just commenting a little bit about, um, you know, the, the fundamental questions that we're facing right now, because part of what you've mentioned is really how development, how economic development, uh, both on St. Helena, but also, of course, at the African burial ground, you know, for a federal building are always in lo at loggerheads with this commemoration's ability to kind of recognize and surface the, pit, the past that's been so badly ignored. Uh, Peggy, would you mind commenting on that? Um, yeah, um, I think that what we learned, you know, we're, we're taking over the past almost 30 years, we've been taking baby steps. And, you know, when the African burial ground downtown was wrapped up in a federal uh, construction project, the emphasis on the part of the community, we as the community and, and interest, other interested stakeholders 
um, was very much about stopping, uh, redefining priorities, uh, and, and really sort of saying, because you, you were confronted with a developer who was resisting um, kind of having something like this stop whatever their, their, their motivation was in terms of getting a building up. But at some point, I think that where we are today, 30 years later, is that where I'd hoped was that particularly since I had been working in the mayor's office of construction, development um, you know, can be a good thing. Um, one of the things is, is that when a developer comes to the table, a developer has a budget, right? And a lot of times when you're faced with these sites that have either been built over before uh, for several, several years, or maybe they haven't been built on at all, but they've been infringed upon. Um, the task or the challenge now is getting developers, unlike 30 years ago, to start thinking about their work or a vision that includes um, the site and its significance, that includes the community somehow, uh, that they're able to weigh in, um, that it doesn't have to be an adversarial uh, um, kind of relationship. That in fact, you know, when you study architecture and design, the idea that a lot of times the premise of your design is rooted in where you're going to put the building. What does the community do? What is the community like? What is the history of that, that community? Um, and how is my building or my design going to enhance it and inform? Uh, and yet you have these people who, when they're confronted with a site that has this kind of significance, uh, it's like backing out of the deal, gotta get out of here, don't wanna deal with it. Um, and I understand some practical reasons, but I think that if you, if, if, you know, I think the conversation now should graduate um, to a level where we're, you know, if it's appropriate, that development need not be the enemy, but in fact, an opportunity, uh, particularly if someone um, has the resources uh, and in a way that designers and community stakeholders can work together to create something that the larger community can be um, can can value uh, in in its cultural heritage as a whole. Thank you. It's really I wish we could just have a whole session just on what you're talking about. It's so important, right? As especially as whole parts of the city are being uh, displaced and gentrified, and the rents have become so out of out of kilter that people can't even afford to live here anymore. Right. How can we deal with that? So we've got to talk about that more and more. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to skip over to Rodney Leon, and then we'll end with uh, Dr. Pace. Uh, so, uh, Rodney, you note that the Black figure at the UN is the Trinity figure representing the spirits of men, women, and children who died during the Middle Passage. Um, thank you for thank you for inserting that. It is a remarkable uh, figure in the midst of that design, not just within the sculpture itself, but of course against the United Nations itself. There's both a kind of haunting quality to that figure, but also this beautiful kind of uh, figure of, of, of uh, kind of emerging and a light, and also, as you say, of solace. Um, could you talk about that a little bit and what that spirit that you're capturing in that figure is? Because in some ways, the question of hope, and we're gonna go to um, Dr. Pace about this as well, the question of hope in the future is implicit in that, in that figure. Yes, thank you, Dr. Chen. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the figure that you mentioned is the Trinity figure. And it represents the spirits of the men, women, and children who passed away during the Middle Passage. So the figure is uh, a figure that, if you look at it, it's not necessarily a, a male figure or a female figure, it's a young figure. It's really a, a representation of a spirit that uh, in the Ark of Return Memorial at the Mill uh, Monument at the UN is meant to bespeak of how these spirits can then return uh, through our actions and the actions of, of, of others, uh, how those spirits can return back to a place where they once came from. 
And um, in that memorial, we had documented uh, 66 locations uh, along the African coast, including St. Helena, where people of African descent were taken from Africa to different parts of the new world. And we engraved the names of those locations on the front of the memorial in a, in a stainless steel plaque. And we also inscribed them in the map of on the wall on the interior of that chamber of that space where you can actually like reach out and touch them. And the theme of that memorial is a three part theme acknowledge the tragedy, consider the legacy, lest we forget. And then the third aspect of lest we forget is what you speak of is the role that we play, you know, Peggy, you know, Lorenzo, you, myself, people at the United Nations reminding them that, you know, this is a, a living and breathing history. We're just uncovering it now. And there is still so much work to, to be done. And, you know, lest we forget and repeat the sins of the past, we need to continue to do the work that we're doing on behalf of the ancestors and on behalf of the people for the children in the future. Thank you. That that was really uh, beautiful. Uh, there's so much poetry in your design and, and the way you talk about it. It's just remarkable. So thank you so much for all of that. Um, uh, Dr. Pace, um, as, as the elder of our group, um, we thought, I thought it would be good to have you uh, maybe have the last word uh, of this uh, remarkable 90 minutes that we've been spending together. Um, it seems to me uh, when you've brought up the Sankofa bird, that, um, that of course it's about looking back towards the past to be able to go move ahead. But I think this moment is also about a moment of reconstruction. We've been through different moments of reconstruction, attempted reconstructions, every time it happens after the Civil War after the civil rights movement. And again, we seem to be in a moment in which reconstruction might be possible, but at the same time, there is so much pushback and anger and repression and some weird nostalgia for a white supremacist past that is so violent and so horrific that it's actually hard, I think, for people to quite fathom that this is where we came from. But of course, this is where we came from. But you yourself express so much heart in terms of being so inclusive, being acknowledging that black past, acknowledging that incredible pain and violence, but at the same time being very open spirited in terms of acknowledging how indigenous people also have to be acknowledged. So there's something very foundational about your way of thinking that seems to be about decolonizing both in terms of indigenous peoples and also in terms of Af African peoples of this United States of North America, perhaps globally, but decolonizing seems to be part of what you're also um, encouraging us to do. So uh, Dr. Dr. Rodney, you have the last word. Um, uh, if you wouldn't mind uh, turning on your, your camera, we'd love to see you and uh, hear from you. I don't my camera, oh, it's my, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, my camera is on? Uh, not yet. There we go. Okay, now we see you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hit that again. Now we see you. Okay, great. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's still, I need to start the video. Start, start my video. <laughs> okay, you see me? Yeah, we see you. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I've uh, lived through a number of the uh, aspects of our development here coming from the deep south. Uh, our, my family was the last uh, migration from the north to the south. Uh, and I was raised in Chicago. And in that process of going from one segregation to the next segregation, Chicago uh, was just as segregated as Birmingham, Alabama. Um, and that was a major challenging me uh, being thrown into one all black school in the south to another all black school in the north. Uh, but I'm a I'm an optimist because I think that we all have to be optimists because 
I look at what uh, Mahatma Gandhi have gone through. I look at what Martin Luther King gone through. I look at what Harry Tubman has gone through and so many other ones. Uh, Nelson Mandela, he was came to New York. I was here to celebrate him. And I have a chance to travel to 15 of the African countries in, on the continent. And I've have been able to travel to six of the seven continents around the world. And, and seeing that one thing that I've learned that's three things that connects us all. Uh, I learned three good words. And one of the words is change is inevitable. We have nothing to do with that at all. Change, the, the sky is changing, your body is changing every second we talk. I'm changing, you changing. And the second word is growth. Growth, <laughs> we can sit here and watch TV all day or we can go to the library and learn something new. That's optional, that's for you. Can I make you grow? You have to want to want to grow. And you want to learn, want to learn something new or want to learn something instead of being stagnated into one area. And then the third word is collaboration. Collaboration is essential for us to survival as human beings. We have to collaborate. You have to collaborate with your sister, you have to collaborate with your mama, your husband, your wife. It's essential for us as human beings to collaborate. So if we put those three words in our discography of thinking, then we all should be about the basic sentences of love. That's what all these uh, great uh, orators have come out of. Love. Love is one of the most fundamental things of our, of our humanity that we all need to adopt very clearly and very heartily. And that what really turned me on was this summer, you know, when I was pro protesting with these young kids in the streets here. Everybody was about love sharing, giving, learning, exploring, collaborating. That's what gives me the desire to be an optimist. It's that very fundamental thing of love. And that's what King talked about. I mean, King talked about that very fundamental thing of love. It's a universal principle. If we could all go adapt to that, and it's hard, very challenging to love somebody who's hitting you over the head, to love, to love somebody who's throwing you in jail, who loves to somebody who calls you a nigger, to love to somebody who's like, hey, you are three fourths of a human being. How can you, that's our challenge as human beings. How do we can turn a word that's negative into a positive? How do we begin to like really embrace a complete, what, what, what really connects us is our strength, our human, you know, we talk about New York is one of the most, one thing I love about New York is it's the diversity. That's our strength. That's our strength. It's our diversity. And we don't, we don't want to embrace that. We just have, can't embrace that diversity. What's wrong with that? Because I'm black, you uh, brown, you yellow, you this. That's the beauty of humanity. I just don't understand that, why we can't get that. So that's to me, what I like to leave is, when I leave this planet, I like to leave the idea of embrace our di diversity. That's our strength, that's our love. And that's what we all have to lock hands and lock horns and embrace, I think. And I could be way wrong, you know. But that's the fundamental of our humanity. And that's a universal thing. Well, beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, uh, you know, for, for saying that uh, so that we can end on that. Um, you know, it's so easy now to think that by um, going online, 
and uh, buying a book called love that or buying a thing, a product called love or promising love, that somehow that's the answer, right? But what you're talking about is actually really hard and something that we all have to strive for. And it's not something that we can just simply buy or acquire or uh, gain through uh, the commercial marketplace. It's, it's, it's a very difficult thing. And um, clearly it's both easy because we are all capable of doing it. But it's also <laughs> one of the hardest things that we can get to, right? So yeah, wow, beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, well, I'm afraid we're gonna have to wrap this up. Uh, it's been over 90 minutes, and uh, but it's been a very fast time because there's been there have been so many beautiful things said, and we just really appreciate everybody joining us for this. And this will be uh, this will be available as a recorded um, uh, session uh, that will get out to an even broader audience. So we're really happy to have all the people who did join us, and I really want to especially thank again uh, the the panel. Um, Mr. Rodney, Dr. Rodney Leon, uh, uh, excuse me, Mr. Mr. Rodney Leon, the architect, uh, Dr. Uh, Lorenzo Pace, um, the, 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 the elder in our midst and the storyteller, the profound storyteller, and of course, uh, Peggy uh, King George, who um, is uh, the leader, the fierce leader um, of, of, of this uh, large project that's across the Atlantic and across the world. Uh, thank you all and thank you the, uh, thank you Al for the uh, Teaneck Public Library for sponsoring this. And of course, thank you Patricia and Natasha for organizing this program. It's, it's been a, a, a fantastic opportunity for us to uh, share this group uh, project. So thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just want to make a quick announcement that this program will be rebroadcast at a later date on the Teaneck Public Library website, and the date is to be determined. So we'll let you know when that is. Um, and thank you kindly for joining us for this powerful discussion. And please visit the teaneclibrary.org to see all the other upcoming events that the EMC has lined up for the rest of the month. And you can register and view them as well as visit the www.eamcnj.org for our website to see more information on the other things that we have coming up this month and next month as well. Thank you all.